Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is October 29, 1978, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 39. It was 21 years ago this month that the Space Age dawned for mankind. On October 4, 1957, millions around the world listened in amazement to the radio beep, beep, beep of Sputnik 1. The world's first artificial satellite was in orbit put there by Russia. In AUDIO LETTER No. 19 nearly two years ago, I revealed how it happened that Russia beat America into space. The United States could have launched an Earth satellite more than a year ahead of Sputnik 1, but our unseen rulers deliberately tied the hands of our space experts for reasons of personal gain and power. As a result, the honor of taking mankind's first step into space will belong to Russia for all the rest of human history. To one who loves America as much as I do, America's default at such an historic moment has always been a very bitter pill to swallow, and today it's even more crushing to see that, after a brief heyday in space, America has defaulted once again to Russia, and this time, as I revealed last year in AUDIO LETTER No. 26, it's permanent. But the history of mankind is more than the history of the United States or of Russia alone. And from a broader historical perspective, the shifting fortunes of America and Russia in space are just symptoms of far more basic currents in history. As the late great British historian Arnold Toynbee has shown, the history of man is a story of spiritual development in response to challenge after challenge. When challenges are met, there is growth. When challenges are avoided, there is crisis. And when challenges remain unmet, there is breakdown and disintegration of civilization itself. The unique challenge of the 20th century is the challenge of space. Given the hindsight of history, it was inevitable that the primary competition to meet this challenge would be between the superpowers of the 20th century, the United States and Russia. Today this competition has been resolved in favor of Russia, and even this outcome was foreshadowed by historical clues two generations ago. The key that unlocked the door to space, as everyone knows, was the rocket. Invented untold centuries ago in China, it was introduced to the West by an Englishman named Congreve. But it was only as the 20th century was dawning that the significance of the rocket for space exploration was first recognized. Two men independently conceived of rockets in this way, one a Russian, the other an American. First came the Russian, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the father of Russian cosmonautics. As early as 1903, the year the Wright brothers flew their first airplane in America, Tsiolkovsky began publishing his writings on space rocketry. By 1913 he had already analyzed the most basic problems of rocketry and space travel, but in addition he had given considerable attention to the psychological and spiritual aspects of putting man in space. And to this day the Russian science of cosmonautics continues to stress these aspects of space travel far more than is the case in the West. Tchaikovsky's speculations and calculations about space travel suffered the same fate as many other developments in Russia after 1917. The Bolshevik Revolution turned life in Russia into an existence marked by terror, hunger, and a struggle for bare survival. But meanwhile, half a world away in the United States, the other father of modern rocketry was at work. His name was Robert H. Goddard. In 1919 Goddard published his first writings on the subject of rockets. Like Tchaikovsky, Goddard independently analyzed the earliest and most basic problems of rocketry. Meanwhile in Russia the great Russian famine brought on by the Bolsheviks was getting underway. Within two years over 20 million Russians, the vast majority of them Christians, would die in stark terror, grinding hunger, and cannibalism. Russian rocketry, along with other forms of progress, had been thrown into the ash can by the Bolsheviks. In the United States Goddard continued his work, which, like the American Space Program decades later, 
was preoccupied with nuts and bolts more than philosophy. On March 16, 1926, Goddard made history by launching a liquid-fueled rocket 200 feet into the air from a farm at Auburn, Massachusetts. At that moment, more than 50 years ago, the United States was in a position to leave all other countries far behind in exploring the eventual prospects of space exploration. But our secret rulers of that day were not interested in anything as frivolous as the vast reaches of outer space. Instead, they were busy consolidating their own gains from World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. So Goddard's seeds of space travel fell on rocky ground here in the United States. When they began to bear fruit years later, it was not in America and not for peaceful purposes. It was in the work of German scientists at Pendamundi in their development of the V-2, the grandfather of the modern ICBM. In the Soviet Union, however, a discovery took place that was destined to lead one day to a very different perspective on space by the Russians. In 1927, the year after Goddard's historic rocket experiment here in America, a Russian scientific expedition succeeded in reaching the site of the Great Siberian Explosion of 1908. They had expected to find a giant meteor crater, but instead they found a mysterious blast area that has absorbed Russian scientists of all types for more than 50 years. As I told you last month, these studies led some time ago to a conclusion that is accepted as fact by Russia's present-day rulers. This conclusion is that the incredible Tunguska blast was caused by the accidental explosion of a crippled alien spacecraft 70 years ago. For this and additional reasons, the Russian leaders are convinced that we are not alone in the cosmos. As a result, the Russian approach to space is motivated by long-term factors that go far beyond the narrow economic and military goals typical in the West. Just six days ago, on October 23, an announcement was made in Moscow which received almost no news coverage in the United States. On that day, Russian astronomer Felix Zigel of the Moscow Aviation Institute made public the Russian answer to the Tunguska riddle. Zigel described the mammoth Siberian explosion as having been caused by a, quote, extraterrestrial probe, unquote, or in other words, a UFO. By allowing this public statement to be issued, the Kremlin confirmed what I told you last month. My friends, the Russians are tackling the exploration of space as the kind of spiritual challenge that Toynbee described long ago as the key to human progress. Meanwhile, the forces of Bolshevism which halted Russia's early researches into space travel have now ruined America's space program. The evil forces set in motion so long ago by our unseen rulers are now leading to self-destruction. Meanwhile, Russia herself is throwing off Bolshevism, and a new era is dawning in Russia and Eastern Europe. My three topics for today are Topic No. 1, Russia's hot pursuit of her Bolshevik enemies, Topic No. 2, America's panic rearmament leading to national suicide, and Topic No. 3, The Public Signs of War to Come. Topic No. 1. Increasingly these days I am asked the same question over and over again, and that is, quote, if the Russians are after the Bolsheviks, why should they kill so many of the rest of us? After all, we haven't done them any harm. In fact, they are getting everything they want so why go to war?" Unquote. My friends, I've tried to explain these things over the past several months, and yet I do understand the confusion it is causing among some people. Many have not been aware of the vast international power wielded by the Bolsheviks who disguise themselves in many ways. Those who do know about this satanic power have the opposite problem. They are tempted to think that the Bolsheviks are all-powerful and therefore that Russia could not have freed herself from the Bolshevik grip. But the simple fact is, my friends, that things do change. In spite of the enormous power of the Bolsheviks, they have been overthrown in Russia. As I said in detail last month, this did not take place in a sudden 
overnight coup d'etat. It was accomplished over a period of six decades of tireless struggle by the self-styled spiritual Communists who now run the Kremlin. The spiritual Communists, unlike the Bolsheviks, are a native religious sect, a Christian sect, which began in Russia over two centuries ago. Today they are abandoning Communism in everything but name, but in their religion they remain perhaps the toughest and most tightly knit group on earth. Having learned the hard way, they view Bolshevism as a totally satanic system without any redeeming features, and after 60 years of struggle that dwarfs anything experienced in the West, they regard the Bolsheviks themselves as less than human. Today they regard the United States as hopelessly infected with the disease of Bolshevism, and therefore they intend to destroy the United States as they would a rabid dog. I have mentioned this rabid dog viewpoint of the Kremlin before, but there is another way in which they view their holy war against the Bolsheviks that is rooted in nothing less than international law. It is the doctrine of hot pursuit. The hot pursuit concept can be illustrated by thinking of a police chase of fugitives. Suppose, for example, that a police car sets out in pursuit of a getaway car, driven by thugs who have just robbed a store and murdered the owner. Even if the getaway car should race across the city line into another jurisdiction, it is accepted practice in general for the police car to continue the chase regardless of where it leads. The reason is that the police are in hot pursuit of the fugitives for a crime committed within their jurisdiction. Today. The rulers of Russia see themselves as the police, and the Bolsheviks as the murdering thugs who are fleeing from justice. In the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, the Bolsheviks robbed Russia of her riches and murdered the owners by the millions. Now, after a struggle of six decades, the spiritual Communists have turned the tables on the Bolshevik outlaws who are leaving Russia in a growing torrent. They are seeking sanctuary mainly in the United States, where they are joining with the Bolshevik elements already here in a new Bolshevik revolution. The Bolsheviks plan to throw America and the West into nuclear war against Russia, so Russia's rulers are fighting fire with fire. Soon their hot pursuit of the Bolsheviks will rain nuclear devastation on our heads. The Russian rulers are aware of the argument that we non-Bolsheviks of America have done Russia no harm and therefore should not suffer with the Bolsheviks. But my friends, I must report to you that this argument, reasonable though it sounds on the surface, draws nothing but scorn within the Kremlin. No harm, they say? Then why, they ask, are we giving unquestioning sanctuary to the floods of Bolsheviks now leaving Russia? And for that matter, they add, how can a people who won't lift a finger to save their own land, America, be counted as friends by anyone else? No, they conclude, you Americans are refusing to recognize what is taking place before your very eyes. It is a takeover by the Bolsheviks, and soon you will wish you were dead. By comparison, they say, Russia's nuclear attack on the Bolsheviks among you will be merciful. The Kremlin is carefully keeping track of the new Bolshevik Revolution now underway in the United States. It's more sophisticated now than it was 60 years ago in Russia, but the Russians know what to watch for. And the progress of this secret and quiet revolution is one of the indicators that are being used by Russian intelligence to gauge the time left to prepare for war. A key factor in the American Bolshevik Revolution is the economic turmoil now building up. Central to all of this is the collapse of the United States dollar. Over five years ago I described in detail the whole plan to collapse the dollar deliberately. That was the subject of my 1973 book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, published by George Braziller, 1 Park Avenue, New York, New York, 10016 and gold 
If today's gold price is measured not in the United States dollars but in hard currencies such as the German D-Mark, the true value of gold will be accurately reflected. But earlier this month I was in Europe and saw for myself just how far the collapse of the dollar has already gone. I've been to Europe innumerable times over the years, but this time I had a new experience. Many shopkeepers will not accept American dollars, whereas they used to be eagerly accepted, and where dollars are accepted they will buy very little. The so-called Almighty Dollar is Almighty no more. And so, my friends, the dollar is losing its international role. It is becoming a garrison dollar, a currency which will still buy a few things here but will soon be almost useless outside the United States. Already the Federal Government is preparing for a reverse split of the dollar, just as was done in the recent past in France. In this way all old dollars will be forced out of hiding. The process of our economic imprisonment is advancing rapidly, and most Americans are still blissfully unaware of it. The so-called Voluntary Wage and Price Guidelines announced by Jimmy Carter five days ago will be replaced by mandatory controls in preparation for war. By the end of this year, 1978, I am informed that all non-corporate Americans will be virtually blocked from transferring funds abroad. Part of it will be done in the name of protecting our economy and safeguarding our national security. But one of the real purposes is to serve the Bolshevik Revolution by closing and bolting the prison gates around America through your pocketbook. As the Russian rulers watch, they see the Bolshevik plan progressing right on track. Soon economic turbulence will be joined by political turmoil, and a little later on there will be shortages, hunger, rioting, terrorism, and as America descends into the hell of Bolshevism, there will be cannibalism in America. Even now our own secret rulers have reactivated the weather control grids around America, which I first revealed last May in AUDIO LETTER No. 34. From September 24 through October 19 they were shut down for reasons related to the autumn equinox, but on October 20, just nine days ago, they were turned on again, and they are once again being used to modify our weather. As a result, strange weather can be expected periodically from now on through this winter. Through every avenue imaginable, the Bolsheviks are marshalling their forces to attack, undermine, and if possible destroy Russia. And to borrow the words used by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his speech at Harvard last June, quote, the fight for our planet, physical and spiritual, a fight of cosmic proportions is not a vague matter of the future. It has already started." Unquote. Two months ago I warned about the sinister developments that were being set in motion within the Roman Catholic Church. I said that the Bolsheviks want to use the Church as a weapon in their war against Russia by maneuvering the Church into an anti-Russian stance under the guise of anti-Communism. By doing so, they expect to enlist 700 million Roman Catholics, one-sixth of the human race, into their own battle to the death with Russia. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 37 two months ago, Albino Cardinal Luciani of Venice had just become Pope John Paul I. He quickly became known as the Smiling Pope, yet he left the scene after barely a month's time. As I said last month, the Bolshevik game plan was going to be tried again with another new Pope, and that is happening now. The new Pope was elected earlier this month on October 16. Instantly his image as an anti-Communist was seized upon by the American news media, and even the name he has taken, Pope John Paul II, signifies a second try in the Bolshevik game plan I revealed in August. Pope John Paul II is the first non-Italian Pope in 455 years, Carol Cardinal Wojtyła of Poland. During World War II, Wojtyła was a member of the Polish underground, 
which fought against the Russian and German occupation forces. For thirty years as a Church official he has challenged and struggled against Poland's Russian-dominated regimes. And just last month, on Sunday, September 17, he played a key role in firing the opening gun of the Roman Catholic Church against Russia. On that day a pastoral letter spearheaded by Cardinals Wyszynski and Wojtyła and signed by all bishops was read in Catholic services throughout Poland. Poland is the most heavily Roman Catholic of all countries in the Russian orbit, with over 14,000 churches and an estimated 85 to 90 percent of the population Roman Catholic. What's more, the Poles have a natural hatred for Russia as Big Brother, so it caused no small concern in both Warsaw and Moscow when the pastoral letter was read to Catholic congregations throughout Poland a month ago. The letter, whose contents reached practically the entire population of Poland, blasted government censorship as, quote, paralyzing the cultural and religious life of the nation, unquote. My friends, the image of the new Pope is that of one who stands up to the Russians, but the way in which this image is to be used is another matter, and I think it is essential that both Catholics and non-Catholics alike know what is going on behind the scenes, for at this very moment the Church is becoming both tool and target of the forces of Bolshevism. If what they are doing is not stopped, the Catholic Church will soon be destroyed. What I am about to reveal, my friends, gives me no pleasure at all. I myself was born a Roman Catholic. I was raised a Catholic. I even studied for the priesthood. For me personally, though, there still were unanswered questions. It was only later in the bush in Africa that I truly found our Lord Jesus Christ. But I speak as one who knows what it is to be a Catholic, and my purpose is to help and to build up not to attack or tear down anything that is good and right. Even if the things I am about to reveal should lead to scandal, I must agree with the words of the wise priest who recently counseled me, quote, It is better that scandal should come than for the truth to be suppressed. Unquote. If the truth does remain suppressed, my friends, the days are numbered for the organized Roman Catholic Church and there will be repercussions throughout all of Christendom. Two months ago one of the briefest papal conclaves in history ended in a surprise election. Cardinal Luciani of Venice became Pope John Paul I. His election had been masterminded without his knowledge by a Bolshevik faction within the Vatican. It was thought that because he was a complete outsider to the Vatican power structure, he would be the ideal puppet Pope easily misled and maneuvered. Within weeks, while the world was still getting acquainted with this man called the Smiling Pope, the Wyszynski Wojtyła pastoral letter was issued in Poland. But Pope John Paul I was turning out to be a disastrous choice by the Bolshevik manipulators. They were failing in their efforts to have him pose a flinty challenge to Russia under the guise of anti-Communism. Instead, he was preoccupied with people and how the Church might best serve them, including the people of Russia. My friends, the stakes are high and the time is short, and the consequences for Pope John Paul I and for Catholics everywhere were tragic. He had been elected to an office he had neither expected nor wanted, and his reaction had been strangely prophetic. As reported by Newsweek for October 9, 1978, Pope John Paul I had been stunned at his election, and he had said to the other Cardinals, quote, What you have done to me, may God forgive you. Unquote. It was almost an echo of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ nearly 2,000 years ago. As He hung dying on the cross, He said, quote, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Unquote. I must now reveal that during the night of Thursday, September 28, 1978, Pope John Paul I left the Vatican alive. He did not die in his sleep that night, as reported by Vatican sources. He lived for three more weeks incognito away from the Vatican before finally being shot in the back of his neck 
by person or persons unknown. On October 4 the funeral for Pope John Paul I was attended by tens of thousands of mourners and witnessed by television viewers in 31 countries. The body that lay in state was not that of Pope John Paul I, who was still alive. But as everyone knows who has ever lost a loved one, a lifeless body never looks the same as a living person had looked. And so, thanks to the mortician's art, no one questioned that the remains on view were those of Pope John Paul I. After that, even if he himself had walked into a church somewhere and announced, I am the Pope, quote, unquote, he would not have been believed. After all, people had seen the funeral on television, and they had read about it all in the newspapers. Pope John Paul I was still alive on October 16, the day that his successor, Pope John Paul II, was elected. Since there cannot be two Popes at the same time, this raises a thorny question. Was the current Pope legally elected? In any case, the man known briefly as the Smiling Pope was put to death the evening of October 19, 1978, three days after his successor was named. Shortly thereafter, his body was cremated and the ashes disposed of. My friends, nothing will ever be seen again of the late Pope John Paul I, and no evidence has come to light that would enable his assassins to be identified. Nevertheless, not all of the evidence of his tragic fate has been destroyed. I refer to the body that now occupies the sarcophagus of Pope John Paul I in St. Peter's Basilica. The body is not that of the Pope John Paul I. It should be exhumed not only for an autopsy but for scientific identification procedures under independent supervision. If this is done, it will reveal the terrible fraud that now threatens the very soul of the Church. If it is not done, the Bolsheviks will have won already in their grasping to manipulate every Catholic on earth for war. In that event, the Church will be used in the cause of Bolshevik warfare against a Russia that is becoming a Christian nation once again. Topic No. 2 My friends, during the past two and a half years a drastic shift has been taking place in the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States. In a pale and carefully controlled way, this shift has been reflected in the public deterioration of so-called détente, but behind the scenes the real shift has been far more profound. Politically, the secret alliance of nearly 60 years standing between our own unseen rulers and the rulers of Russia has been terminated unilaterally by the Russians. This astonishing turn of events was not foreseen by America's real rulers. As I first mentioned in AUDIO LETTER No. 28 last November 1977, and as I discussed in detail last month, it has to do with a fundamental change in the power structure of the Kremlin. And now, as we are on the threshold of Nuclear War I, our unseen rulers are no longer confronting the carefully programmed war they had been planning on, but a genuine free-for-all. For the first time in the 20th century, a major war is coming that will not be controlled on both sides by our unseen rulers. As these changes have been taking place in the political sphere, unexpected and revolutionary changes have also been taking place in the military equation. Our unseen rulers have been pursuing secret military projects unknown to the public for nearly two decades but they have made gross miscalculations in their secret master military strategy. That strategy came to ruin one year ago last month in the secret space battle of the Harvest Moon, which I reported that month in AUDIO LETTER No. 26. So now the United States is feverishly rearming for war. 
Our unseen rulers are trying to fight off their own rising panic as they see disaster looming closer and closer. War is now so close that they are beginning to shed some of the cloak of secrecy surrounding formerly super-secret weapons programs. When I first revealed them long ago I was generally not believed, but secrecy always exacts a toll of increased time to carry out a project, and they no longer have any time to spare. And so just this month the public has been allowed to get just a glimpse of secret work in two areas of critical importance. One is that of underwater missiles. The other is that of beam weapons, especially the awesome charged particle beam. In AUDIO LAIR 13 for June 1976 I revealed the beginning of Russia's total military double-cross of their former secret partners who then controlled America, the four Rockefeller Brothers. Based on very solid information from my own confidential sources, I reported that a nuclear weapon was resting in the waters of Seal Harbor on Mount Desert Island, Maine. It had been planted there by the Russians where it would be able to vaporize the summer homes of David and Nelson Rockefeller. As I say these words, Nelson Rockefeller is trying to sell his Seal Harbor home, which has been owned by the Rockefeller family for two generations. Likewise, many wealthy Rockefeller associates in the area seem to have lost their enthusiasm for the beauty of Mount Desert Island. Like Nelson Rockefeller, they're trying to sell their property in the area and bail out. But my report of June 1976 about the Seal Harbor bomb led to far more than the present unsettled real estate conditions there. It proved to high intelligence that the Dr. Beter AUDIO LETTER could be trusted to tell the truth. And from that point onward I began receiving large amounts of intelligence information that is not entrusted to any other public information channel. Only the following month, July 1976, I revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 14 that a new missile crisis was underway. It was the underwater missile crisis of 1976, a far more dangerous affair than the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. The Russian Navy was planting short-range underwater-launched nuclear missiles at strategic locations within our own territorial waters. They were preparing for a nuclear Pearl Harbor type surprise attack based on naval strategy. This intended first strike was to be totally different in nature from the ICBM first strikes we hear about all the time. Unlike an ICBM attack, the Russian underwater missiles would provide no warning at all because they were planted only miles from their targets and inside our radar defenses. At the beginning of August 1976 I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 15 on an urgent basis. The Russian Navy was working fast and nothing at all was being done to stop it. There was only one hope that the hands of America's military would be untied in time to avert imminent disaster. That slim hope lay in making the situation a public issue and bringing the United States Government under sufficient public pressure to bring about appropriate action. So in AUDIO LETTER No. 15 I spelled out the locations of 64 Russian underwater launch missiles and hydrogen bombs in navigational coordinates. They had been planted in the territorial waters not only of the United States but of 24 other countries worldwide. Very soon Russia would have been in a position to erase all naval power on earth opposing that of the Soviet Union. At the push of a button launch commands would have flashed worldwide by satellite, and within moments Coastal target areas all over the world would have begun vanishing in nuclear fireballs. My listeners responded by showering the Pentagon with tapes, telegrams, letters, and telephone calls. This unexpected and overwhelming public pressure did the job temporarily, and by the end of August 1976 the United States Navy had removed all the missiles and bombs in our waters. Likewise, those around Great Britain had been pulled out by the Royal Navy. In AUDIO LETTER No. 16 I reviewed the tense events that had been taking place. These included my meeting at the Pentagon that month on September 16, 1976 with General George S. Brown, then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
By that time many of my critics who did not have my information sources were ridiculing my exposure of the Russian underwater missile crisis. Some tried to say that there would be no reason for the Russians to do such a thing since they already have ICBMs. In doing so, they glossed over the paramount strategic value of surprise, which would be produced by the zero warning time of the Russian underwater missiles. But most of my critics simply waved it all aside by saying such a thing is not feasible. They tried to say there is no such thing as underwater missiles, so my claims about a secret crisis could not be true. But meanwhile, I met with General Brown, then top military officer in the United States, for well over an hour in his office, because by then the Russians were far along in planting a second round of the so-called impossible missiles in our waters. Just as before, crucial information about them was being blocked from reaching General Brown through normal channels. So as I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 16 that month, General Brown had invited me to confer with him as soon as I alerted him about my new information. Of course, if my information in AUDIO LETTER No. 15 had not proven correct, General Brown would have had no reason to meet with me. Through the end of September 1976, General Brown continued to direct American activities to stave off the Russian underwater missile threat, but as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 17, the treasonous Red Friday Agreement signed on October 1, 1976 by then-President Gerald Ford ended all that. Soon thereafter General Brown was cut down. He was humiliated over nationwide television over trumped-up criticisms of his conduct when his only real crime was doing his duty. He was shown that he would have no chance of helping himself or America by going public in any way, as I discussed in AUDIO LETTER No. 17 and in AUDIO LETTER No. 23 for April 1977. Concerning what I told you then about the neutralization of General Brown, consider the words attributed to General Brown by the Atlanta Journal this past August 3, 1978, with regard to the usefulness of quitting in protest over a policy decision, General Brown was quoted as saying, I was perfectly prepared to do it, but I had to ask myself what good would it do. It would not reverse a decision. No. It will be like a pebble on the beach. They'd get another Chairman tomorrow." Unquote. After General Brown was neutralized, our unseen rulers tried in vain to reinstate their secret alliance and therefore a controlled war with the Soviet Union. As part of their insane effort in this direction, they allowed the Russian Navy to resume planning their underwater missiles without harassment. And as I reported to you nearly two years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 20, this policy was based partly on the existence of a secret fleet of American undersea missiles. Unlike the small short-range Russian missiles, the American missiles were mammoth offensive ballistic missiles. They were planted in the Atlantic and Pacific in the Secret Operation Desktop under CIA control. In their undersea resting places, as I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 20, they were invulnerable to attack. They were also the largest, most powerful nuclear missiles on Earth, dwarfing our conventional ICBMs, and their purpose was blackmail to make sure Russia followed the script during Nuclear War I. But I also revealed then that the CIA's undersea super missiles were springing leaks one by one and being ruined. The following month, in fact, nuclear debris from one of these leaking missiles off Florida, Atlantic Missile No. 8, poisoned large numbers of whales in the area. More than 120 of them beached themselves to die near Jacksonville, Florida in only a few days' time. To this very day many self-proclaimed instant experts among my critics have kept telling their followers that undersea missiles like these are impossible. And while they always cry for documentation, they have totally ignored the documentation I presented in AUDIO LETTER No. 20. Mr. Tony Hodges, a prominent Honolulu environmentalist, had unearthed information about the definite feasibility of undersea missile systems from experts. In December 1975 he published a warning document on the situation from which I quoted in AUDIO LETTER No. 20. 
It seems that expert testimony is not enough to convince most people of the truth. What it takes is to see it on television or in the newspapers. Well, my friends, it has finally begun to happen. Eleven days ago, on October 18, CBS Television News carried a report about Pentagon studies now underway on underwater missile systems. The next day Radio Australia went further and disclosed that, quote, Pentagon generals have shown President Carter an outline of a scheme to submerge huge diesel-driven craft off the American coast to create a nuclear missile system less vulnerable to the increasingly accurate Soviet warheads." Unquote. But my friends, the undersea diesel launcher concept is just a cover story for the real undersea missile crash program now in progress. Six months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 33 I revealed that Operation Desktop had been reactivated. As I explained then, a fresh fleet of CIA undersea missiles was to be planted beginning off America's Atlantic coast under the cover of drilling for oil. At that time the Baltimore Canyon area where the drilling is taking place was being touted as an oil bonanza for the United States. Today it's six months later, and news reports have been telling for months now about one dry hole after another. If they were really looking for oil, the whole thing would be seen as a fiasco by now, but instead the work goes on day and night at site after site, and soon the oil companies will line up to bid for additional leases in the area. I can now reveal that as of now seven new CIA undersea super missiles are in place off our Atlantic coast, and the Russians know exactly where each one is, because hovering overhead there are presently five Cosmospheres on patrol armed with charged Particle Beam weapons which can destroy the missiles as soon as they are launched. As unnerving as the race in underwater missiles may be, it now takes a back seat to the race in beam weapons. This involves not only high-power lasers, but the even more devastating Particle Beam weapons. Last September 1977 I reported Russia's first operational use of Particle Beam weapons in space. On September 20, 1977, the Russians blasted an American spy satellite into a huge fireball in space as it passed over the Petrozovodsk Observatory in northern Russia. And barely a week later, on September 27, 1977, the secret American moon base in Copernicus Crater was silenced by Russia's neutron beam attack from Earth orbit. America had just lost the Battle of the Harvest Moon. Immediately America was forced to stop short in her secret beam weapons race with Russia, for suddenly our unseen rulers were teetering on the edge of war itself, and Russia suddenly was calling the shots. Just as happened in the matter of the underwater missile systems, many people were soon ridiculing the idea of operational Russian particle beam weapons. Such a thing, they said, was far in the future, if not impossible. But what I made public then was true, my friends, and now, after one short year, there has been a complete change in the public attitude of top American defense experts. The reason is that in the kamikaze do-or-die strategy of our unseen rulers against Russia, beam weapons are now being tackled in a crash program, and only by letting it become visible in a controlled way can maximum use be made of our technical resources and manpower. Most members of the general public probably have heard very little about the sudden new emphasis on beam weapons in the United States, but in technical circles, which is perhaps where it matters most, it is now very widely known. Earlier this month, on October 2, Aviation Week and Space Technology Magazine, an aerospace industry publication, began a series of articles about America's sudden new plunge into beam weapons. One article quotes a Pentagon official as saying, quote, Beam weapons are no longer in the Gee Whiz Buck Rogers death rate category, and Senior Carter Administration members no longer give it the back of their hand like they once did, unquote. 
Based on the assessment of what Aviation Week refers to as a top-level United States official, the article continues in the words, quote, the general attitude in the past year has changed from one of skepticism over the possibility of fielding Particle Beam weapons to one of speculation that beam weapons may be possible within a reasonable time." Unquote. At another point in the article, Aviation Week relates the belief of United States Air Force officials that a space-based anti-satellite neutral beam system could be operational quote, within a couple of years. It would be much sooner than you might believe." Unquote. In other words, my friends, when I told you about America's defeat in the Battle of the Harvest Moon one year ago, the official line was that such weapons were virtually impossible. But now America's panic rearmament is underway, so now we are told these weapons are just around the corner. Nevertheless, we are supposed to perish the thought that Russia already has these weapons deployed, because once we realize that we will all know that our Bolshevik rulers are leading us into national suicide. All of our ICBMs and bombers will be of little use against a Russia defended with Particle Beam weapons. In his editorial of October 2 earlier this month, Aviation Week editor Robert Holtz, a highly informed American, said, quote, Beam weapons offer the promise of reducing strategic nuclear weapons to a negligible factor in the future. If successfully deployed, beam weapons can end the long reign of nuclear terror introduced by the ballistic missile and its thermonuclear warhead." Unquote. My friends, the reign of nuclear terror spoken of by Holtz has already ended for Russia. As I reported last year, the Russian rulers signaled this fact on September 27, 1977, the very day that the Battle of the Harvest Moon ended in victory for Russia. That day Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko denounced the United States in a speech at the United Nations. In addition, I now quote the exact words I said in AUDIO LETTER No. 26. Gromyko added that the Soviet Union is now ready to halt underground nuclear tests for a while, even if others do not. The reason for this statement, which surprised everyone, is that the Particle Beam has now superseded other nuclear weapons as the front line of Soviet armaments." Unquote. To quote one further line from the Holtz editorial, if the Soviets achieve this capability first, it will give them enormous crucial leverage in imposing their political will on the rest of the world. Unquote. My friends, the Russians have achieved the Particle Beam capability first, and as I explained last month, they are preparing now to dominate the rest of the world with it. Russia's rulers have no intention of permitting our unseen rulers to save themselves by means of panic rearmament, for Russia is monitoring not only the political and economic progress of the Bolshevik Revolution here, she is also keeping a close watch on America's war preparations. Russia's sheer momentum is so great that time is on Russia's side right now, and the military gap between East and West is growing wider every day. But as America's rearmament progresses, there will come a point when that gap will stop widening and begin to narrow. From that time onward, time will no longer be on Russia's side, so Russia will wait no longer. When Russia's advantage is at a maximum, war will come. Meanwhile, Russia's rulers are using the time remaining in efforts to neutralize as much of the world as possible before the war, as I explained last month. The real reason for Russia's determination to wage nuclear war on America, my friends, is the Bolshevik control that is now seizing our land at all levels. The only way to prevent war would be our own swift action to throw out the Bolsheviks and remove the threat they pose to Russia. Rearmament cannot save America. It cannot prevent war, and it cannot give us victory in war. It can only guarantee that America will endure the wrath of sabotage, geophysical warfare, nuclear weapons, particle beam weapons, invasion, and occupation. So by panic rearmament the Bolsheviks are bringing on national suicide for the United States of America. Topic No. 3 on the night of the Harvest Moon last year, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko delivered a sudden late-night message to Jimmy Carter at the White House. Government spokesmen in the major media portrayed the message as a breakthrough in the SALT II negotiations.
But as I revealed three days later, Gromyko's real message was an ultimatum. The Battle of the Harvest Moon had just taken place in space, and in a stunning upset Russia had won. Ever since then the SALT talks have been a mask hiding the true face of Soviet-American relations. Time and again we the public have been told of encouraging progress on SALT. Time and again we have been assured that a SALT Accord was, quote, 95 percent complete, unquote. And time and again this has been followed by reports of new snags, and the euphoria has evaporated. The cycle has been repeated over and over, and today, 13 months after the alleged SALT breakthrough, it is being done again. Early this month there was official optimism, quote, unquote. Now there is caution, quote, unquote. And even the alleged new snags are always over the same stale old issues, the backfire bomber and so on. But this month there was a change. One year ago this month I reported that Russia was pressuring the United States to surrender through secret provisions of a SALT II treaty to disarm America, but now we are committed to rearming in secret. Even if SALT II does come eventually, it will be purely cosmetic for propaganda on both sides. And this month Chief American Arms Negotiator Paul C. Warnke resigned. His specialty in arms matters has always been the dismantling of American military might, so he no longer fits the changed climate for war. Meanwhile, war preparations are quietly speeding up on all fronts. Effective the first of this month, the length of basic training has been shortened throughout the armed forces. Also this month the biggest mobilization readiness test since World War II got underway for reserves in the National Guard. The exercise is codenamed Nifty Nugget and runs from October 10 through November 8. By stretching it out this way, maximum use is being made of routine weekend drill periods, thereby avoiding widespread public attention to such a major exercise. On the international scene, too, the urgency is becoming apparent. The three countries whose real estate is critical to the American First Strike Plan, namely Norway, Iran, and China, are increasingly in the news. As I explained in detail two months ago, American subcraft, that is, submersible aircraft, are to attack Russia's four Cosmodromes from Norway and Iran. From China's Sinkan Province, Russia's two Cosmosphere installations in Siberia are to be attacked. But since late June Russian intelligence ships have been stopping in northern Norwegian waters, scouting out the subcraft staging areas, and in August a large Russian spy plane crashed on a northern Norwegian island, further heightening the tension there. Iran, for her part, was devastated by a huge earthquake last month, brought about by Russian geophysical warfare, as I explained last month. Iran now wants to cancel purchases of 70 F-14 fighter bombers, 140 F-16 fighters, 31 F-4 Phantom jets, and 1,000 air-to-ground missiles. But what was praised most by Moscow Radio was Iran's reported decision to back out of buying the so-called AWACS airborne spy system. It was to have been used along the border with Russia to monitor Russian military activities. As for China, the tug of war between East and West continues on the surface, but as I reported last month, Russia and China have already reached an agreement in principle for a secret alliance, and six days ago on October 23 the Sino-Japanese Peace Treaty went into effect, and Russian geophysical warfare will force Japan to sign up with Russia soon. The great new Asian axes, Tokyo, Peking, and Moscow which I warned about five years ago in my book The Conspiracy Against the Dollar is coming into being. This month four American spy bases in Turkey were reopened for one year. The arms embargo against Turkey has been lifted, and on October 23 so was the arms embargo against Pakistan. The United States is now considering arms aid to Somalia, and behind the scenes American official behavior toward Rhodesia and South Africa is changing. It seems our unseen rulers want all the allies they can salvage for the coming war. My friends, as we are confronted today by the evil forces of Bolshevism in our midst and the threat of war, we should recall these words, quote, We have no spiritual glow, no fervor, no fire against evil. 
We stand facing war today with the impassivity of a person who stands motionless before the flood simply because he did not wish the flood." Unquote. These are the words of journalist and lecturer Frederick Snyder, which were spoken on November 30, 1941, just one week before Pearl Harbor. And today, my friends, all of America is a Pearl Harbor. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.